Hey, check this out. The biggest video of the year is here now. Welcome to Masterclass Cinema, the series where I discuss one aspect of a movie I love and still feel inspired by. The previous video on Terminator 2 mainly focused on all the effects techniques outside of the CGI, making it one of the greatest practical effects action movies in cinematic history. I mentioned if people would like to see a follow-up purely focusing on just the T-1000 to let me know in the comments, and the demand for a follow-up was massive. And so we're back discussing the design of the T-1000 and how it was such a unique character brought to life with both old school practical effects as well as show the impossible with computer graphics. The T-1000 was a character we followed into a new age of filmmaking. Joining me again from the first video on Terminator 2, Godzilla Mendoza. Hey there, I'm Xavier, aka Godzilla Mendoza. You may know me as the guy with the funny accent from our first episode where we covered everything else in Terminator 2. You can check out my own channel where I talk comics, games, and animated shows. But today we're running down all the visual trickery that brought to life your favorite liquid metal brother of a metalhead. But before we get to the main proceedings of the video, Daniel would like the following statement read. <coughs> After the events of the previous Terminator Masterclass Cinema episode, Cordery Effects would like to issue a correction that was made aware to him in the comments. The electricity effect was not done by cell animation, but rather filming a Tesla thing and matting out the black. However, a cell animated outline of the garbage truck was used to have the electricity go behind the truck as well as in front. Thank you for your time and now back to the episode. So apparently James Cameron had the idea for the T-1000 for the original Terminator, and at one point the character was actually written into the script. This isn't a rumor, it actually comes from someone from behind the scenes. What we see in Terminator 2 wouldn't necessarily be 100% what we would have seen in Terminator 1, unless James Cameron has a lot of concept art that he never released publicly about the character. The first Terminator was planned in absolute detail, which not only comes across in the concept art, but also the storyboards. If this T-1000 character was actually in the first movie, it would be likely he had some concept art of the character in some form. But from what concept art did make it out of the first movie, matches the final product very well. James Cameron's painting of Kyle and Sarah embracing as the Terminator endoskeleton rises from the flames, the future war, even having lunch with Arnold Schwarzenegger, he immediately made a concept painting of Arnold as the Terminator. So that's my acknowledgement to the T-1000's inception prior to Terminator 2. The real birth of the character comes out of the up and coming computer graphics process being pioneered by industrial lights and magic. I think the first case of a computer generated image was in the first Star Wars, going over the Death Star plans. Slowly but surely, the process was evolving. The first case of a full character made with computer graphics was the stained glass man from Young Sherlock Holmes. There are a few shots in The Last Starfighter that are actual CGI, ranging from the background to some of the fighter ships. Much of the original Tron used CGI with a techno computer aesthetic. But the next two uses of CGI would prove to be the foundation of the T-1000 character. In the movie Willow, there is a scene where a person is being transformed into different types of animals. And rather than using practical effects and a series of cuts to blend the transformations, CGI was used for the morphing. This meant that each animal could morph into the next in one shot. And the final example would actually come from the James Cameron movie right before Terminator 2, The Abyss. The Abyss features an alien race with really unique designs. They also have many abilities, and amongst them is the power to control water. They can manipulate water to make an air pocket for one of the characters to breathe, to controlling a massive tidal wave. But amongst these abilities is the water tentacle that imitates the faces of two of the lead characters, which of course was James Cameron's introduction to the possibilities of CGI. They could create an intelligent moving object, which can look like constant rippling water, and not be a practical puppet that requires hiding strings and rigs, but more importantly, it could accurately morph and articulate a face without animatronics or stop motion. And with that feature alone, the inception of the T-1000 was born. The new advanced Terminator to face off against the T-800 would be liquid metal and could transform its entire shape before your eyes. Prior to this would be different puppets built for different aspects of the transformation. Typically with werewolf movies like The Howling or American Werewolf in London, and to an extent The Thing. A transformation over a series of cuts and different angles because you couldn't build a full size transforming puppet that can shape shift in the same shot. Well, the last ditch effort would be stop motion animation for the morphing. Now as much as this video will be discussed 
discussing the revolutionary CGI that would go on to make this movie such a smash hit as well as begin the boom of CGI driven movies, the T-1000 still needs an honourable mention for the use of old school techniques to help sell this character. Adding to the point of the previous Masterclass Cinema episode on Terminator 2, the T-1000 was to be a new, fresh, never-before-seen effect on screen, but still couldn't quite exist without the help of practical effects. Although we covered a lot of practical effects in the first Terminator 2 episode, the T-1000 was basically left out because most of the effects covered were for recreating things in the real world. Jets and tanks shooting at people, a city blowing up, people's limbs with robotic extensions or interiors or large vehicles crashing. The T-1000 on the other hand is this character that doesn't exist in the real world. No being is liquid metal that can morph and mimic people or form stabbing weapons. And the practical effects used for the character were really only when he was taking damage or mid-transformation. Tasked with bringing these selected effects to life, the talented Stan Winston and his team of artists would create body extensions and puppets for the T-1000's character. Every time the T-1000 gets shot, every bullet hole leaves a ripple in the metal. Whether a dot from a pistol or an aluminum pie dish from a shotgun blast. Also the primal weapons as mentioned by the T-800, which would then go on to be parodied in The Simpsons. Many of the weapons the T-1000 forms usually morph out of his clothing. When he's in the cop uniform, the forearms seamlessly blend from the cloth shirt to the metal spikes. It would be obvious now to just point out that, you know, they made the metal spikes for his arms, but back then there was no reference for this liquid metal gimmick. Jeanette Goldstein has an anecdote of not quite having an idea of what the T-1000 effect would look like based on the script. She's quoted as saying, The script kind of said, she transforms, or something like that, but it didn't say anything about liquid metal. It must have said, arm turns into a blade and stabs but it didn't get explained to me what it was actually going to look like until I was on set. Even when it was explained to me, it was hard to imagine because it had never been done before. I was surprised as anyone when I saw it. It would be easy to just list all the stabbing gags they made, but this is the beginning of the end for quick practical gags. When you can quickly make a metal spike pop out of someone's body within one second with CGI, back then they had to rig these special effects. The actor playing Todd had one blade going through this milk carton, as well as a retract blade attached to his head showing the spike going into the wall. There were so many one and done effects that were made just for this production. When the T-1000 stabs the guy on the bridge, he has a little pop out blade gag strapped to his back. Practical effects that go by so fast on screen, whereas in this day and age you can do that effect even faster with computers. Speaking of what is easier to do today rather than back then, cloning a character. You could get a stand in and film a dirty over the shoulder shot and a wide shot with a split down the middle. Something I'm quite familiar with. Use a clip from my Scarlet Spider. Uh, cosplay video. I do a lot of that effect in there. You could use motion control cameras and film a super complex one take like Back to the Future 2, or you could just get twin actors. If it's the 90s and you're making an amazing sequel, chances are it features these twin actors. Don and Dan Stanton. Also not the only real life twins to replicate the T-1000. Linda Hamilton's twin sister featured in the chip removal scene was also used for when the T-1000 tried to trick John at the end. Amongst the rest of the Stan Winston wizardry, there are some great animatronic effects. When the T-1000 gets his head shot in half, this was a great first indicator as to how indestructible the character is. And then the entire showdown of the movie showcases so many mixed effects. A whole bunch of one and done effects like when the T-800 shoves the spike through his body, when Sarah shoots him in the eye. Probably the most impressive practical effect made for the T-1000 would be when he's frozen from the liquid nitrogen. After using all the other techniques, puppet legs that rip off, hands stuck to the floor, and a full body statue filled with explosives and shrapnel. Mixed with the amazing sound effects, the T-1000 shattered into pieces. The liquid metal puddle effect was accomplished by using mercury and a hair dryer. It's so simple yet such a memorable moment. I think an honorable mention goes to the one effect that was mentioned in the comment section of the first T2 episode. There are a few quick shots where the T-1000 has just morphed, shot so quick that there was no point in setting it up as a CGI shot. You can see the first instance when the T-1000 stabs the guy from the truck, his arms spray painted silver, implying it was just morphed back from being a spike. And at the end, after the T-800 punches him in the face and he morphs his head into two heads, the following shot is a complete head-to-toe silver T-1000 costume. 
blink and you miss it. My favorite aspect about the T-1000 is how restrained he is as an effect and design, yet still being so imposing and fantastical. By making this character the most human it can possibly be makes you believe in it even more. The best comparison to make would be Arnold Schwarzenegger's T-800. Both were very effective in their methods of portraying killer robots, but sort of in opposite ways. The way Schwarzenegger works so well as the Terminator is what he brought to it. Having such a muscular physique, you can buy that there's a giant robot underneath all that skin. Although still being fresh to America as a bodybuilder rather than an actor, keeping his talking to a minimum and all of his actions are purely physical. He made for a very convincing killing machine, but mostly he brought his bodybuilding reputation into that character. Robert Patrick on the other hand is playing a completely different model of killer. It's an advanced prototype of a Terminator that writes all the wrongs of the T-800 model. Where Arnold's character is a big brute force, the T-1000 would be a sleeker machine. By looking like a regular person it can blend into a crowd much much better. Since it can imitate clothing, what better way to achieve your goal than by disguising yourself as a law enforcer? And rather than being a silent but deadly Austrian, the T-1000 can speak perfect American English. But also, on top of comparing just those traits to the T-800, this character won't even follow the same reveal structure as the first movie. When Arnold's T-800 started off seeming like a man, it's harder for Sarah to believe that it's a machine. Then the robot slowly starts to be revealed. The whole medical scene where he is patching himself up, you see little glimpses, some mechanical parts, but it all builds up to the big reveal. The most terrifying robot ever. Cyberdyne's interpretation of a human skeleton with red evil glowing eyes. Kyle Reese was telling the truth, it's a machine. The T-1000 on the other hand, his true form is revealed right at the start of the movie, and from that moment, fighting this Terminator will be a whole new ball game. Kyle Reese's speech to Sarah in the first movie, I'd imagine the speech would be completely different for the second movie. It can imitate a law enforcer, it can imitate your loved ones. Guns won't kill it, the elements won't kill it, and you will never see it coming. One of the T-1000's best traits is how it subverts what you would expect an opponent for Arnold's T-800 to fight. You would expect something bigger and stronger, but Terminators follow the pattern of any technology. The next model gets sleeker and smaller with more functions built in. The T-800 is big, bulky, and stands out in a crowd. Once it's injured, it's exposed. If you damage a T-800 enough, its whole mission will become more difficult for it. The T-1000 can shapeshift. Bullets can leave a dent which then reforms back into being spotless. That's another factor with the T-1000. It stays clean. Nothing about it is obvious that it's a robot, making it the perfect killing machine. Also speaking of clean, everything the T-800 does is violent. He has clean movements, but the outcome is always violent. The T-1000 is very efficient in how it kills its victims. Granted, when it comes to John Connor, he's a bit more forceful because that's his target, but everyone else, he just spikes a vital spot and it's done. Also, as pointed out at the start of this video, when the T-1000 assimilates someone, even that is so clean and simple. Allowing a simple shot like when the T-1000 is walking as the guard, the camera pans to the wall, pans back and it's Robert Patrick, this isn't really a cheap shot because this is how clean and fast the T-1000 can morph, which all comes back to how this was the perfect character to bring us into the world of CGI. If this character was going to be as bulky and powerful as Arnold's character, it would have suspended your disbelief too much. Very much like the dinosaurs from Jurassic Park, treated as realistic animals rather than angry monsters. CGI from its very beginnings, simple but effective and as real as possible. In my opinion, the Terminators now do too much. The physics and gravity are lost with the overuse of CGI. The T-1000 would only work if the character itself was as much like a regular person as possible. And this is where Robert Patrick plays one of the most important roles in the development and history of CGI. Before Andy Serkis led the charge of performance capture being an art form for actors, there was no other choice for Robert Patrick and ILM. From the very beginning, he was working with ILM having his walking, body movement, facial expressions digitized as he was developing the character. And back then there was just no method to how to capture an actor's performance. Everything was expensive. Experimental. Nowadays, you can just wear a motion capture suit, the set has cameras mounted everywhere to capture the data, and mostly the CGI model of the character you're playing has already been built and it's just a matter of applying your tracking data to the 3D model and then cleaning up whatever is necessary. Obviously, that's a brief justification of today's process, but in 1991, 
While they were working on the movie, the process was just as much during pre-production and production as it was in post-production. Robert Patrick had to have his T-1000 walk locked down from the beginning so it could be programmed into the computer so anytime the T-1000 walked, it had to match the performance. Also on top of that, every single visual effects shot had to be planned to a T before filming. It's kind of incredible to think that when these filmmakers are trying to figure out this complex, brand new way of incorporating special effects into a movie, this one actor is also going going through this massive journey too, learning the process along with the filmmakers, which I think deserves its very own section. I'm Robert Patrick. In Terminator 2, I play the T-1000 prototype Terminator, the future's most fearsome machine, the most advanced, unstoppable, most technically perfect creation of all time. The persona of the T-1000 was very unique from the aggressive, stoic nature of Arnold Schwarzenegger's T-800. He has the ability to perfectly interact with people, but once the target is locked in his sights, then it's all business. It's one thing to praise Robert Patrick's approach to playing a Terminator compared to Arnold, but he had his work cut out for him. Not only did he have to play the character himself, he had to coach all the other actors playing the characters the T-1000 is imitating. And this is where the T-1000 stands alone compared to the T-800. A lot of what Arnold adds to T-800 is pretty much who he is as a person. Muscle-bound, Austrian accent, brutish. But since he is such a massive star, he will always be brought back for Terminator movies. People want to see the T-800 just because it's Arnold. The other side of that coin is that Robert Patrick isn't as big of a star, so there's no demand for him to keep returning for sequels like Genesis, but his portrayal of the T-1000 has kept the character so strong in people's minds that he would continue playing that character. Not in the Terminator sequels, but cameos in other movies. Yes, officers, there's something wrong. Have you seen this boy? Which just goes to show, there have been many evil Terminators since the T-1000, but Robert Patrick's portrayal of this character has always remained just as iconic as Schwarzenegger's. Despite being less talked about and revered as a pop culture icon as his skeletal counterpart, the T-1000 is truly a special piece of filmmaking history. A character of pure fiction that could only be brought to life by pushing the limits of both technology and imagination. In creating the T-1000, the boundaries of what we could do both practically and digitally in the world of VFX were pushed to new heights. This guy's menacing, memorable presence played a major role in changing filmmaking by showing what we could do by thinking outside of the box and exploring new avenues of the filmmaking process. You have to admire him for that place in history. But on top of that, he's just a super cool character. I'm glad I made this follow up. For a while there, I didn't really feel like returning to Terminator 2 so soon, but discussing the T-1000 over the rest of the effects in T2 was such a treat. We are seeing the best that practical effects can offer, as well as the birth of this new filmmaking tool, waiting to change the way films are made forever. The T-1000 design is the ultimate collaboration. James Cameron to think up such an idea, Robert Patrick to bring this character to life, Stan Winston to build most of this character's abilities in reality, and the team at Industrial Lights and Magic to show the world what they have never seen before. And of all of the filmmaking and effects techniques used in it, this movie is still so disciplined. Every detail is so well crafted and thought out. And it's so amazing to think in this day and age, the T-1000 was the key that unlocked the door of possibility. And once again, adding to why Terminator 2 Judgment Day is a master class of cinema.